Greetings, everybody. Greetings, everybody. We are live right now. Come on in. Come on in. Tell your friends. Tell your communities. Share with your friends and your communities. Let them know we are live right now. I am excited about this opportunity that I get to share. This word that the Lord has put in my heart and my spirit with you. I, I want you to take a moment just to share this with everyone. Let them know we are live right now. I'm making sure that I share this also on my page. As well as some other places as well. Come on in, everybody. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. I'll give it a few more minutes. Listen, we're, we're excited tonight. Um, I, I'm excited to be able to, to come to you for our Thursday night session. We, we were not live last week, but I did not want any more time to pass. If you can hear me, let me know. Put it in the comment section. I'm looking at your comments right now. Um, if you can hear me. Uh, just put it in the comment section. Let me know that you can hear me. I want to make sure that I'm coming in, coming through uh, loud and clear enough. Uh, so just, just put it in the comment section that you can hear me. Uh, I'm watching the comments. I'm looking for you. But we are live tonight. We're not going to be long at all. I just want to share something that the Lord has put in my heart to, uh, to share with you. And I hope that what we do endeavor to share tonight will be inspirational, will be encouraging for you. Uh, but definitely... Uh, all right. Thank you, sis. Uh, excellent. Ashley, I see you, sis. Jamie, thank you so much, sis. All right. I, I, I'm glad that you all can hear me pretty well. Again, take a few moments to share this uh, live feed with your uh, your communities, those that you have influence with. Um, send a DM. Let people know. Put it on Instagram. Take a screenshot. Let them know we are moving live. I, I feel that this word that the, the Lord has given me, uh, it's a very important word. And I just kind of want to just speak to us tonight. I want to just kind of impart uh, some information that I hope really uh, ministers to us. Um, and we don't want to be long tonight at all. We want to stay within our, our time frame. So I'm just going to give you a few more minutes. Uh, but I miss you all. I love you all. I hope you're doing well. I know so much has been going on during this pandemic and, of course, with the election as well. Um, it's been a whole lot going on. Uh, but God has been faithful to us. And of course, as many of you know, I am not on social media right now. I've taken a moment just to uh, to take a reprieve, if you will, a, a break, uh, just to be able to re recalibrate, to recoup, uh, to get my own self together, uh, to readjust and make some, some necessary uh, strides in the right direction with some personal endeavors that I have. And it has been necessary, and thank you for those of you that have been praying for me, praying for my wife. Uh, the Lord has been tremendously good to us. Uh, we hope to share some praise reports with you very soon about some of the things that the Lord has done and is doing. Um, but it has been a, a very necessary time for us. So uh, I want you to take this opportunity again. Let me know that you're here. If you're viewing this live, let me know that you're here. Um, and please take a moment to share this with your communities. I again, I am excited about this word tonight, and I'm excited about what the Lord has allowed YMA to do thus far. The Lord has blessed us to do some incredible things, and so I'm grateful for that. Uh, good to see you, Jeff. What's going on, man? Blessings to you, sir. Uh, good to see some family, friends, and loved ones coming on. Uh, so grateful. Listen, I, I want you to stay with me. I promise you there is a word that I want to share. Uh, as you all know, that normally with YMA, we have teaching sessions and training sessions and development sessions and things of that nature with specific subject matters. But tonight, I wanted to come to you and just kind of share with you my heart 
as the Lord has dealt with me concerning some things. And I really hope that what I'm sharing with you will speak to you directly and even minister to your heart and to your spirit um, in a real way. So I, I want you to, to join in again, share this with your community, share this with your friends and families, let them know um, we are on live tonight. I'm just going to give you about 30 more seconds before we get started and get right into the word because I do want to be mindful of the time. Uh, it is right now 9.05, and so we are on schedule. Um, I hope to be done within 35, 40 minutes, if not less. Um, and so I, I've been trying to do that anyway, where I, wherever I go to minister or opportunities <laughs> that I have to minister. I've been trying to be more mindful about being time conscious. Of course, in other nations and countries, of course, they, they'll have you preach for two hours and three hours straight um, because it's just a different um, environment, different culture, different appetite. Um, and here in America, we're a little spoiled because we got so many preachers and so many teachers and so many conferences and churches. Um, so we, we have to be time conscious and hit it right there. But if you stay with me, I promise you there's some things that the Lord will speak to you um, most definitely. Uh, but thank you so much, guys, for coming in. Uh, I love each of you. Again, I'm encouraging all the young ministers, every young minister, um, a part of the Young Ministers Alliance for the International Pentecostal Young People's Union and Pentecostal Assemblies of the World at large. I'm encouraging you to watch this because this word that I have to share with you is very important, very critical. And I believe that there are so many things that are going on. But before I go any further, let's just real quickly pray. Um, and that will set this tone for where we're going tonight. Father, thank you for this opportunity to go into the word. Um, I pray that something is said that will bring um, a fire under us. It will provoke us to really move forward in all that you've called us to do in this season. And, and help us to really become all that you've called us to be. Lord, I pray that this word will speak to us directly where we are. And that it will motivate us to really consider what we must do in order to achieve the divine plan and the will of God in the earth. So Lord, have your way. We thank you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I, I want to honor all of you who are part of the Young Ministers Alliance and to all of you that support us consistently. Um, this has not been possible without your support. And to my leadership team, I want to take the time to honor each of uh, my leader team, le leadership team members um, to Minister Jamie Lott out of California, who's done a phenomenal job, to uh, Evangelist Liz Clark out of uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, um, who's been phenomenal in every way possible with assisting in ministry and different leadership responsibilities, to my dear friend, uh, uh, Elder Denzel Tubbs out of Ohio, out of Cincinnati, Ohio, who's been phenomenal. Um, a phenomenal support and help, and to Pastor Caleb Kirksey, my brother. I'm so grateful for him out of St. Louis, Missouri, who's been phenomenal. Each of these individuals that I mentioned make up the leadership team for YMA, and we ought to applaud them, celebrate them, salute them, um, and show them love because without their support, what we've been able to achieve in this year alone, really get off the ground running this year, would not have been possible without them. So I never want to take the opportunity for granted to show them honor because I believe in honor and they have been extraordinary um, in every way possible. But I, I want to be honest with you. Um, I see you all coming in. Thank you so much. Uh, and I love each of you. Um, I want to address something. There's, there's this elephant in the room, if you will, and I kind of want to just touch it. Maybe it's just me. And, uh, and if, it, if it is just me, that's fine. I'll accept it. I'll embrace it. Uh, but maybe there are a few others that feel the same way that I do. And I, I want to just kind of just dive into this just for a quick moment, if, if I can. I feel that with all that we've been blessed to achieve, uh, to achieve this year, um, out of the box ministry, whatever you want to call it, different areas um, of ministry that we've been able to do because of this pandemic and how it has pushed us to be able to do some things different. As we now approach the closing part of this year, I feel as though there has been such uh, a level of exhaustion. Let's be real. In our humanity, it is natural for us to feel this way. But I feel that there's been such an exhaustion. Um, though it would seem as though, though it would seem as if people have been able to rest and be more chill and relax um, during this year because of how things have changed drastically. 
I feel that 2020 has been one of the most productive years and busy years, even though things have been different and have happened differently. But even with all that we've been able to achieve and, and do, it is easy to lose momentum. It is easy to let your guard down and become relaxed because you, uh, you get settled in what you've been able to accomplish so far. And it's easy to drop the ball, uh, for the lack of a better term. But I want to express, if we drop the ball now, and I'm, I'm talking to me, um, if I don't talk to anyone, I'm talking to me tonight. Uh, if we drop the ball, we may miss out on something or some things that God really intended for us to engage with. There are some opportunities, there are some moments that we cannot afford to miss in this season. And I want to speak in that vein with this lesson that I want to share with you. It's coming out of Mark's Gospel, the 14th chapter. And I just want to raise a few verses for our concern today um, in verse 43, beginning in verse 43. And this is what the Word of the Lord says. Mark 14, I'm starting at verse 43 and we'll go to verse 52, if you will. Mark 14, 43 through 52, it says here, And immediately while he yet spake, cometh Judas, Jesus is speaking, and here comes Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude, with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token. Judas that betrayed Jesus gave them a token, saying, Whomever I shall kiss, whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. It's, that's Jesus. This will be the indication that I give you that this is Jesus. Take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Judas goes to Jesus after he gives the soldiers and those that are going to be responsible for taking Jesus or seizing him into custody. Uh, G Judas makes his way and says, Master, Master. And he kissed. Jesus, another translation or another uh, 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 another gospel writer says that he kissed him on the cheek and they laid their hands. Those that came with Jesus, they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them stood by and drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Peter sees one of the soldiers <laughs> and he cuts off the man's ear. He cuts off the man's ear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief? Am I a thief? Is that why you're coming to me? You're coming to me as if I'm a criminal? With swords and with staves to take me? Is that all necessary? I was daily with you in the, te in the temple teaching, and you didn't take me then. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. His disciples, those that were with Jesus, forsook him, and they ran away. And there followed, notice this, here's where I want to go, verse 51 and 52. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth, cast about his naked body, and the young men laid hold on him. And he left the linen cloth, this man, we have no record of his name or where he's from and who he is. But he left his linen cloth after they grabbed a hold of his, his cloth, after they grabbed a hold of the sheep. He left it and fled from them naked. And verse 53, and they led Jesus away to the high priest and with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. It's in verse 51 and verse 52, which is something very random, literally interwoven into the fabric of this text. Uh, uh, just a small detail that seems very random, and, and it's hard to understand why Mark put it here at first glance. But Mark just leaves or inserts this small detail within the grand scheme of this entire text. And then once we hit it, and once we read it, it's done. We see that there was this young man lurking around, 
in this linen cloth, naked. And when the soldiers see him and they grabbed him, he escapes from them. He leaves the linen cloth and he runs away naked. Though this is a small detail in the text, I, I want to kind of explore it for a moment. And, and, and in, in doing so, I want to talk to you from this, this subject just for a brief moment. A missed moment. All right. Just for a brief time, I want to talk about a missed moment. All right. If you will allow me, I'd like to share from a place of sincerity that I feel we are literally standing in a unique space and time, unlike anything we've ever experienced before. We see all around us as we view the geographical and even the political landscape of our nation and world. We see the radical era of violence, racism, bigotry, uh, unusual uh, events in the weather occurring, as well as a greater uh, lack of regard for the things of God. Now, the reason why this is important for me to address this is because for all of us, who profess and claim to be ministers of the gospel, it is of great importance, and I need you to hear me tonight, it is of great importance that we understand our mission as it relates to the time we've been assigned to. It's not by accident, it's not by an accident or coincidence that God has breath still flowing in your body right now. It is not by an accident or coincidence that you're still living, that you're still functioning, that you're still flowing right now. God has you alive in this space and time for a reason. Because there's great ministry. You got to hear me. There's great ministry that must be fulfilled in the earth. But it cannot be done if you're not in your place. So... When we, when we look at what's happening in the world, I won't get into all of the various facets of what's going on. If you look at the news, you know. If, you, if you're not living under a rock, you are very much aware of what's going on in our world today. But you have to see the spiritual significance that's connected to what's happening. Because if you pay attention to what's going on in our world today, right now, before our very eyes, you will see that God has strategically set things in motion for a drastic move of God that will shake up the earth unlike anything that has happened before. And the way it will happen, the way the move of God will happen, hear me, is when we... Fulfill the agenda of the kingdom, which is for lives to be changed and souls be saved through the preaching, hear it, and teaching of the gospel. That is our responsibility. And if the truth be told, this is nothing new. This is the same command, this is the same charge that Jesus gave his disciples, and Matthew records this. We find it in Matthew 28, verse 19. Matthew records these very words that Jesus gave to his disciples before he ascended back into heaven. He says to them, Go ye therefore into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son of the Holy Ghost. Now, my argument tonight is not to deal with uh, the distinction between Matthew 28, 19 and Acts 2, 38, because some will say, well, Matthew 28, 19 is a contradiction to Acts 2, 38, or Acts 2, 38 is a contradiction to Matthew 28, 19. And that's not my argument today, because reality is these two verses complement each other if you properly dissect them. They do not disagree with each other. They do not uh, 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 contrast or contradict one another. They actually complement each other very well if you study the text. But my time is not allowing me to deal with that tonight. My assignment is to point out that this is the charge that Jesus gave them. As I leave, you now have a responsibility to go into all of the world, teaching all nations, and baptizing them 
They must be saved. That's your responsibility. That's the only way this move of God is going to happen in the earth. You must now share what you've received. All right? You must share what you've received. And, and when we look at this, this was the whole purpose behind what Christ had downloaded. There it is. What he had downloaded into them through constant training, development, and mentorship. All of that was designed for them to then take what they received and give it to the world so that others would be drawn to Christ and follow in the Christian way as disciples of Christ themselves. So God established a system, a, a cyclical effect, if you will, where he then now disciples men who he then develops and trains to then disciple others so that others can follow those disciples who are now apostles as they continue to follow Christ. And we as the church, we as ministers of the gospel have the same responsibility we must disciple others, and then they too are developed to then disciple more, all right? That's the whole mandate and responsibility that we have in the kingdom. So it is without question that God was very strategic in every decision he made and every plan he implemented. God was very strategic in all of that. And if I could take it even further, I would tell you that from the beginning of Christ's life until the very day he ascended into glory... There was a, a strategic plan in place that governed his entire life. For the sake of this dialogue, I, I would like to place more emphasis, particularly on the significance of Christ's desire to even recruit disciples. There's three things that I want you to take note of when it comes to Christ um, recruiting men to be followers of him. And it's fascinating because when we really study the scriptures and dive into what we are seeing in the four Gospels, very specifically, it is amazing to see that there are three things that occur with Jesus in relation to discipleship. He shows us the art of assembling a team. That's number one. The art of assembling a team. Number two. He shows us the demonstration of true leadership and mentorship. That's number two. And number three, he shows us how to implement a proper succession plan that will continue legacy. Jesus shows us through his teaching and his training and development of disciples, the art of assembling a team, the demonstration of true leadership and mentorship. And number three, how to implement a proper succession plan that will continue legacy. I, I, all of this, and I, I want to kind of unpack this for a moment here. All of this was incorporated within the strategy of recruiting disciples. The art of assembling a team. The demonstration of true leadership and mentorship. And how to implement a proper succession plan. All of this was attached to his ability to recruit disciples. Uh, yes, we know that they were followers of Christ, but that only gives us the overall objective of what Jesus intended to do. But when you study the intricate details surrounded by the strategic plan of God, Christ knew that in order to effectively, hear, hear this, to effectively establish the kingdom on earth, it could not happen without the king coming to earth. And recruiting those who he saw could take what he would give them and radically spread it throughout the entire globe. Never forget it. Effective leadership. Hear this. Effective leadership is when the leader, him or herself, holds the capacity to not only dream, but develop strategy on how to bring the dream to life. Now, any great leader would tell you the dream is too great for the dreamer himself. And understand this in context. I'm not saying that the dream of God that was set in motion through Jesus Christ was too big for Jesus to handle by himself. But understand, when we look at the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, whenever God provided leadership to his people, he did it through human agency. 
And he understood that, yes, he would spend a space of time on earth as a man when his time was completed. There still had to be those put in place who could continue what he started. Do you see it? There still need to be people in place to continue the purpose, continue the legacy of discipleship, continue the legacy of ministry that he himself would initiate. So that's why he needed a team. He had to assemble a team. He had to have a team that could assist in producing the dream. But when pulling together a team, a team is only effective as uh, its leader is willing to be and the extent that the leader is willing to go. Therefore, the leader will, will assemble its team members based on the skills that he or she can identify each one has. Uh, but even if it wasn't uh, needed to make the dream, if it wasn't enough to make the dream come to pass, then the leader then has to have the capacity to pull more out of each of those team members. So, in other words, as a leader, you assess the giftings and skill sets in individuals that God has brought to you. But you also assess what their capacity is in that moment. And if they don't have the full maturation of their gifts and their skills, you as a leader must pull more out of them. You have to pull the rest out of them. And that's what Jesus did. He was able to identify what each of these individuals had. But he also understood he had to pull more out of them. So when Jesus meets the two disciples in the beginning that were the first to be chosen, Peter and Andrew, his brother, he gives them an invitation to join him on a journey that would change their lives forever. He says, I understand you are fishermen, but if you follow me, I will take the principle you already know about being a fisherman and I'll give you greater insight as to how it works as it pertains to what I'm trying to achieve. Because I, if you follow me, if you follow, if you follow, if you follow me, I will show you how to go from being fishermen to being fishers of men. That's what Jesus that's what he shows them. He shows them how you can go from being fishermen to being fishers of men. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is where we now find ourselves here in the text. Jesus has now, he's coming to the culmination of his mission. He's coming to the, the climax of what he was sent on earth to achieve. The moment that was prophesied about. The moment that was foretold by Isaiah. The, the ultimate experience that would shift the entire trajectory of the world was about to happen. And here Jesus has, have in place men of God who, has, who have followed him, who have been with him this entire time. But in our text, we find them all assembled in a place called Gethsemane. And while they're in Gethsemane, Jesus gives a specific assignment to his disciples. He's, they just had their last meal together. And Jesus has finally given his instructions and have told them what's to come. He's already talked to Peter about how he would deny him and how Satan desired him to sift him as wheat. But he had already prayed for Peter that his faith would not fail. We 
see that he releases Judas to go do what he's been uh, designed to do and to do it quickly. Although Judas is kind of trying to figure this thing out, but he understood that Jesus was already uh, uh, spying and he could already uh, uh, see the game that Judas was playing. He, he could already pick it up. And after all of this, Jesus says, I need y'all to go with me because I got to go to the garden. I got to go to the place of the crushed olives to pray because it's only when the olive is crushed that the oil can flow. Which is now unique why Jesus is called Christ, the anointed one, the Christos, because he is the olive that was crushed. And only through his crushing, the oil, the anointing, could flow. So the irony is here is the olive in the place or in the garden of olives, the crushed olive. He's here praying, but he gives his disciples instructions. I need you just to wait with me for one hour. And I need you to watch and pray. I'm going to go further into the garden, but I need you to stay here. And I need you to pray and to, to be watchful. I need you to stay alert. Well, as we navigate through the, the text and we look at the context or the setting of our text here in Matthew 14, we find that the disciples could not follow a simple instruction. Jesus prays twice. The first time, he, he comes back from his prayer and they're asleep and he wakes them up. He says, could you not watch with me? Could you not tarry? Could you not wait and pray with me for one hour? All I asked was for one hour. Could you not fulfill that assignment? I, I need you all to stay alert. I need you to stay awake because this is serious business. I'm about to leave you, but I need you to watch out for the environment while I'm praying. He goes back to pray. And the scripture says that when Jesus returns again, the men are still asleep. But this time, Jesus does not bother bothered to wake them. In fact, the scripture says that he tells them, keep on sleeping. Keep on resting. Keep, just stay asleep. There's no need. Because I understand that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus is able to identify that their humanity still got the best of them. And though their task was simple, it was still difficult in relation to their human frailty, their flaws, their inability to follow one simple assignment. Scripture says, now when we arrive to verse 41, that Judas identifies Jesus with a kiss. He identifies Judas with a kiss. And the men, the soldiers... The centurion soldiers or the army that came with Judas that were assigned by the Pharisees to siege Jesus, to put him into custody. custody. There's a detail in the text that seems so random that I want to show you. It's in verse 51. The scripture says here in verse 51 that there was a young man wrapped in linen cloth. That's what the scripture says. It's in verse 51. Uh, there was a young man wrapped in this linen cloth. He was naked underneath. And they took a hold of this young man. The soldiers that came for Jesus. Somebody snatched this young man. But the scripture says that he was able to escape the, the snatching that they took or that they made towards him. And all they were able to really get a hold of was his cloth, the linen sheet that was wrapped around him. And he ran for his life naked. He was willing to risk embarrassment. He was willing to be embarrassed for the sake of survival. Now, some of you are probably asking, 
what in the world is going on? Why did I take the long road to get to this point? I, 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 I wanted to deal with this for a moment because I want to show you that as random as this detail seems to be in the middle of this text, as random as this detail seems to be, that Mark just some kind of way includes in the middle of this text is not as random as you may think. This young man who was literally wrapped in what would be considered a bed sheet seems to have been sneaking around the whole time out of curiosity looking at what was happening. And there are some theologians who have various perspectives concerning why he was there, who he may have been. But if we took away all of those ideas and thoughts that commentators and Bible scholars and theologians provide us with concerning why he was there or who he may have been, Let's look at the simple detail for what it is in the text. It's this man who's here. But the question is, when did he get here? In the midst of all of this chaos and confusion that is happening, in the midst of all of this uh, 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 all of this violence and interrogation and all of the things that are happening related to Jesus. Where did this young man come from? When did he arrive on the scene? Did he just arrive here when the soldiers got here? Or could it be that from the time Jesus was en route with his disciples to the garden and arrived there, to the time he was taken away, this young man was somewhere in the distance following or was hiding in the garden already? I, I, I don't know which perspective is right. It still remains a mystery to me. However, what I do know is that he was there and because he was there, he was then also taken because although the other disciples fled away, he was still there. And they were able to capture him by his garment. But he was able to take off the garment and run for his life. The reason why I'm showing you this is because regardless of who he is or the purpose for why he was there, the fact is, here is a young man who could very well represent a soul that was wandering around in the midst of all that was happening, curious about what was going on. And could it be that the reason why Jesus told his disciples from the beginning, I need you to stay alert. I need you to stay awake. I need you to stay watchful is because there is an opportunity, there is a moment for ministry that you don't need to miss. But you will miss it if you spend your time sleeping. That's what I'm trying to share tonight. For those of you that have made the sacrifice to stay with me and to tune in, and I'm really about to stop here. I wanted to show you the importance of a missed moment. Here are men of God. And, and understand, yes, these disciples are men. And of course, there are others that will uh, give credence and credibility to Mary Magdalene being also a disciple of Christ. But I want you to see yourself, whether you're a man or a woman, I want you to see yourself. Here are disciples those that were chosen by God. 
present, given an instruction by Jesus, while I go further into this garden to pray, I need you to stay here and watch. I need you to stay sensitive. I've been training you. I've been developing you. I've been preparing you. I've been mentoring you for ministry. I've been teaching you how to discern the times and how to be sensitive to the environment and to the atmosphere that you are involved with. I've been teaching you how to not miss moments. I've taught you how to be ready at, a, at any given ch chance and opportunity to minister. Because you never know when a moment will come where you must do ministry, but you will miss it if you spend all of your time sleeping. Trying to rest. Trying to recover. It's not that rest isn't necessary. It's about knowing when to prioritize purpose. And when to be sensitive to a moment. Because if you're not sensitive, you'll miss it. Friend, I know we've been doing a lot this year. Young ministers, I know we've been achieving a lot. And this is spe I'm speaking to myself as well. I know we've been endeavoring to do a whole lot. And you've been exhausted and you've been pulled at your wrist end. I know it's been so much going on. So many adjustments, so many changes, so many moving parts. I get it. But I'm encouraging you, as the Lord has been dealing with me, we cannot miss the moment. We don't know when an opportunity, when there will be a time for us to do ministry on the spot. We don't know who's lurking in the distance out of curiosity. Who's intrigued by what's going on, but not too sure as to what's going on. But if we're not careful, if, we, if we're not in tune, if we're not paying attention, if we're not awake, we will not be able to catch that soul and minister to them and speak life to them so that they can be saved because we're so busy putting more focus on what we need rather than the assignment we've been called to fulfill. I hope you hear my heart tonight. We cannot lose momentum now. While I have been taking the time to rest, I made it very clear that ministry must continue because while, yes, I may need time away from social media to get some other things together, that doesn't mean I stop working. <laughs> Though I may not be as visible it doesn't mean ministry stops. We got to make sure that we don't drop the ball in the area that really counts. There's too much ministry to be done. I encourage you, those of you that are watching, I strongly admonish you. I strongly, strongly encourage you. Don't miss the moment. Don't miss the chance to minister because you're so busy sleeping, it's time to wake up. I do believe that Jesus is coming soon. He's not coming soon because of COVID-19. No, he's not coming because Trump is in office or that Biden is next in office. It's, 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 that's not it. Jesus is coming regardless of what's going on in the world. Yes, they give signs and indications to what's going on. But Jesus is coming. If we look at what's going on as indications, let's move beyond the United States. There's so much more going around, going on around the world that's giving indication into, uh, concerning the, the return of Jesus. Let's not become so Americanized or uh, the United States uh, focused or, or concentrated. We, we got to look beyond. Jesus is coming soon and there are many other signs that point to the reality that is coming soon. But because we understand this, we can't drop the ball, y'all. We have to be about our Father's business. Now is the time to do it.
I hope this word stirred you. I hope what I've shared with you tonight has put a fire under you to really evaluate where you are. It's time to wake up, y'all. We got work to do. I love you. Be encouraged. I'll talk to you soon. God bless.